So today is a very, very special, uh, today yes. is a very special yes. day for us, uh, for all of us who are part of this group, uh, being the part of the group, we finished, uh, we are completing oh. one year, by end of this uh, session, we will complete one uh, long year. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, so. Congratulations, Joe and group. Yeah, thank you. And God bless you. And point. God bless you now, our group and you and your family. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, in yeah. fact, uh, I was uh, talking to Brother Johnson today. Uh, mm. So he very casually said, uh, you know, he will commit uh, for 40 days. Mm. Uh, you know, so that is how we started on 8th of uh, February. Mm. And uh, we were wondering what to do after 40 days. Will we complete? Will we take, you know, will we prolong to, for, till 40 days? There are a lot of, uh, lot of uh, things uh, uh, that wow. were there. Yeah. So um, uh, finally, I think, I think uh, the Lord uh, really led uh, so far, uh, you know, which uh, absolutely is a miracle. Number mm. one is that, you know, people coming at this time from different parts of the world mm. they, is a big uh, blessing. You know, we have people from Canada, from North America, from Australia, from Malaysia, Singapore, mm. India, <laughs> Middle East. Amen. Uh, you know, but uh, it has been uh, such a blessing. We can't even, uh, you know, stop thanking the Lord. Mm. Secondly, that the topics, the world, you know, each topic is a discovery by itself. Yeah. Because we never uh, thought that we would, uh, you know, have so many topics. Yeah, yeah. As I, as I say this, I have no idea, I have no view of what is in store for this uh, for this ministry in the next uh, coming weeks or months. Yeah. I have no view to it, but I'm trusting we as a ministry, we trust in the Lord. Amen. We are waiting for his guidance. See, something uh, I, I learned is that, not learned, I read is that, uh, you know, the providence of God is very, very different from, you know, the other things. Uh, providence yeah. is something which you have to completely trust in the God. You trust in God when you have nothing else in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. When you have nothing, is when you really believe in the trust in the providence. So yeah. I wanted to thank all of you who who stood uh, by us, uh, who encouraged us, uh, prayed for us, uh, who continuously thanked God uh, for us on behalf of us. I just wanted to you know remember and uh, you know remember all of you and uh, you're all in our prayers uh, uh, every day. Mm. Thank you so much for that. That is the uh, first thing which I want to tell you before we start praying. Yeah. So, okay, mm -hmm. so we will uh, make a, we'll pray. We will. Yeah. Uh, Jos, yeah. Jos, can I quickly say something? Sure, sure. Uh, uh, I wanted to mention your leadership in this, in this entire one year. Uh, it's been phenomenal. The way you conduct these sessions you have been a blessing to not only one or two, but to us all. Because uh, you say, uh, we don't know in the next year how God will lead us, but he's, he's giving us so much through you. So he is using you so powerfully yes, to bring to us so such a banquet, you know. And uh, the amount, I was just, when you mentioned it yesterday, uh, in the session, I was just thinking in this past one year, just reflecting in this one year of just being a follower with happy families as to how much has been my spiritual growth and what I have got from this. So uh, God bless you and your family and continue to do what you're doing. He will lead you and he's bringing so much more to us. I'm so excited about the future and, and this year ahead as well. Okay, God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Loyola. Thank you for this uh, encouraging you. words. Uh, Jose, I second that. Huh? <laughs> yeah, Thank you very I'm, much. Sure, I'm sure so many, uh, I mean, every one of you, you know, uh, reflect the same view or much uh, deeper view. I thank all of you on behalf of Happy Families. See, the only thing is that, you know, probably uh, people see me uh, every day, uh, but uh, I am only a representative of the whole ministry. We have six families who are behind this, uh, you know, with this behind this ministry. We meet, uh, meet, uh, uh, you know, regularly and uh, ask the Lord for the guidance. 
and uh, so far uh, lord has been leading us uh, from a, from a physical ministry to a uh, online ministry virtual ministry it's a big shift for us also so thank you so much uh, so let us pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil amen father we thank you the only word only prayer that comes uh, from our mouth today is a prayer of thanksgiving o lord lord there's nothing else which we can ask of you more than what you have given to us o lord is something which we can't even imagine lord every day as your word says give us today our daily bread yes so lord man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of god and you literally made it happen in the last one year lord every day without fail you've been giving us the word lord and that word is sustaining us lord jesus and that word only will sustain us lord you're building you have you have built a faith in our hearts lord many of us when we started we didn't even know what it what is to have faith but lord each time without even we knowing the faith through the word that we were hearing as your word rightly said faith comes by hearing lord it was not by our our choice but lord but by your plan that we uh, we uh, were able to listen to your word and our faith has increased lord let it continue to increase lord lord even if we have we, even if we have to uh, choose between many things uh, many things in the world lord lord give us the grace lord all to choose you to choose you lord jesus uh, among various options that we have and that is what lord we look forward from this bible study to have a strong uh, faith a faith uh, like uh, like uh, the like the parable you said a man who built uh, the house on the rock yes lord on this on you the rock let uh, all of us build our homes our souls our lives for all this we thank you and praise you in jesus name we pray amen 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 good let's uh, start and uh, at the end of it as we are concluding uh, let's conclude with the word of uh, thanksgiving for the kind of sacrifice that uh, you people especially the six families and joseph's family have taken up Uh, initially it starts as a sacrifice before it becomes a routine and gets accepted and gets into our uh, daily uh, so the sacrifice is what god looks for and the faithfulness you know faithfulness is different from faith faithfulness is keeping it up sincerely every day against all odds working through it and you plan 40 days and the lord has taken you across here that is just a tip of the iceberg of what god can do with the, the commitment that we can bring to him praise god <coughs> so galatians so in the uh, letter of galatians paul is angry it is basically an angry letter okay you can sense the tone of paul in it he greets his re- readers and has little warm praise for them it is snappily getting to the point but the shock and dismay replace the usual warmth of paul he begins with a long note of uh, cordiality and uh, calls himself the apostle of praise but here he is just getting to the point quickly and there is dismay in the letter why what is happening there is a crisis that is threatening the galatians and paul starts with the people responsible for this crisis galatia seems innocent of the sins of corinth that means yesterday we studied about corinth the kind of city it was it was a trade route it had all kinds of people and it was straddling various activities apart from trade and diplomacy and you know um, uh, army people the army and everything there and every kind of sin used to be there but this is not the problem with the church in galatia but common everyday jewish affairs okay so this is more of a jewish influence on the church in galatia okay people are insisting on jewish methods to be followed uh, claiming that uh, this new faith which has begun the way uh, is an offshoot of judaism so they are claim, claiming some, um, some importance <clears throat> and the jews are insisting 
the Greeks, the the Greek Jews are insisting on uh, some of their methodologies being followed because this is their comeback act. You see, so they've been branded as people who compromise their faith. They are Greeks. And they've mixed with the culture. But here is one chance to, you know, and this new religion is coming in. Let's bring all our traditions into it so that at least in this we get to keep what we can keep or what we would like to keep. Okay, but Paul has uh, no such concessions there because he is a person who understands so well the Old Testament and so well the revelation of Christ that he receives. And so he does not want to compromise. It's something very important for pioneering in the faith and especially for missionaries. So uh, common things like observance of festival days and the practice of ancient traditions, especially circumcision. They wanted to get Titus. Titus was a Gentile convert. They wanted to get him circumcised to be, because Titus was sent for troubleshooting uh, uh, in, in, in the churches and he had to be sent to Galatia as well. So they were insisting that, you know, this heathen, this uncircumcised person, how are you sending him to us? How are you even delegating to him? You know, that kind of tone. So that is the Galatian church. So this is where the kingdom is negotiating with the various traditions, cultures of the world. And Christ is accepting of all. In spite of Israel failing, God did not delay. He sent Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, to Israel. But he brings the, uh, brings the Messiah onto the scene. That is God's capability. In spite of who fails him or who he succeeds with, his plan moves on. <clears throat> the Galatians were unduly stressing on Jewish traditions and would soon undo what Christ had done. So they, will, they were uh, bringing in unknowingly uh, in their new enthusiasm, in their newfound enthusiasm of a new faith. They were um, unknowingly bringing in back these traditions. So it became like a revival unto traditions and a restoration to rituals, you know, that kind of a scene was coming on. So they would start trusting in their own human effort and the keeping of the law to gain acceptance from God. That's what is going to happen. It's going to become a new wine in, uh, in an old bottle, okay? And this is going to be an old wine in a new bottle. That's how they were going to work this out. If the Galatians continued like this, the bedrock of the gospel would crumble. God's unconditional acceptance would be crumbling. So faith in Christ would become just one of the many steps in salvation and not the only one. So they would remove faith and they would replace it with law because they are familiar with the Jewish law and they would like this to be their homegrown church, you see. So the gospel could become perverted even in a good sense. You know, even though you're bringing back the Judaic law, it could, uh, it could be different in its meaning and it's in its application. So that is what we are seeing in the book of Galatians. So Paul has to come onto the scene strongly. He's expressing shock and dismay and he's telling this is not what, what we are in for. And this is not what we can expect in Christ. So he's talking about no other gospel. The most important thing is he's talking of, he, he, now he understands that various shades of the gospel will come in. Various <clears throat> people are going to paint it in their own in their own styles and fashions and conveniences. They're going to domesticate this religion according to what works for them and what doesn't work. That's a threat. So Paul is again reiterating his his uh, his position, his call in God, and uh, Paul is telling, "See, I'm accepted and prayed over and appointed by the apostles." And uh, even though Paul opposes Peter, see, he's qualifying his position, but still not agreeing with Peter because Peter and Paul hadn't come to an agreement yet. And later on, they, they in, the, in the fellowship, they come to an agreement and Peter does withdraw uh, what he, the position he held on to initially. So Paul brings about an argu argument about whether it is faith or observance of the law that gets us merit from God. And he's talking about the law and the promise. He's talking about Ishmael as well as uh, Isaac, the promised son as well as the law. And he's talking about sons and daughters of God. There is no more Jew or Gentile, and there is uh, no more slave or free. And uh, there is no Jew or Greek, uh, Gentile or male or female, slave or free, for all of us are one in Christ. So, you know, uh, uh, in, in this, he brings equality, especially in our context, he brings equality to women. You know, God is going to treat, God is treating all of us as equal. And we are children of God. Nowhere we are going to qualify in our gender, in our ethnicity, or in our adherence to the law. Jew means adherence to the law. Ethnicities, Jews, Greeks, and Gentiles is 
ethnicity and then agenda male and female and preferences what god prefers male over female you know all of that he rubbishes so then paul uh, expresses his concern for the galatians and the galatian church and he's talking to them about freedom in christ above all the most important thing is life in the spirit which brings about freedom in christ it was for freedom in christ that you were set free and then he is talking about doing good to all and he brings a very strong argument about circumcision okay he still what he is insisting is not circumcision that is important but it is a new creation a circumcision of the spirit um of from the uh, old nature removing something off which is the circumcision of the spirit and um, giving in to the way of the spirit and what was uh, what was a law he brings it purposely into symbolism and expresses that if you're not doing what the law wanted you to do the law wanted you not to be circumcised physically but wanted you to live by the freedom that god has for you circumcision was a sign of that freedom now you made that a law unto yourself you want to impose that on everybody you know that is why uh, you know not to uh, on a humorous side Uh, the tithe is a law and so is circumcision the law we cannot keep one without the other if we want to keep we should keep everything you know so uh, this is meant for the jews and uh, it does not mean the others will all have to come under this law so today a lot of things have been coming to conveniences and those are what is causing problems in the church every two slides we'll take a break okay this is the second slide and after this we will take a break to field questions and then get back because uh, we have two more days and we we're, we're not going to rush it but uh, we just don't want to uh, drag on to another day because the other last two days are also packed with uh, with topics that are essential so this is about galatians so paul's letter to the galatians is basically admonishing correcting putting in perspective for the jews what you shouldn't be insisting on and even having a disagreement with peter on record you know this letter would go to peter also the letter that goes to galatian the, the church at galatia would go to peter also he knows very well that so he's not kind of uh, talking behind people's back you know in those days putting it in writing is a big thing because they put it in writing we have it with us today so paul never shied away from speaking on uh, topics something very very important important in the, our fellowship you know this encourages right fellowship so we come on to paul's letter to the ephesians what brought him to write to the ephesians this ephesians is a good news book now what is ephesians what is thessalonians what is corinth all these places paul traveled and established yeah, churches okay now each of these churches are missing daddy the missing paul okay now he is the founder and he is the guy who is going places no doubt the other apostles were going huh? see thomas came to india paul didn't all right so there are people traveling the harvest is huge the workers are just a handful now you cannot just call everybody and put a worker seal on him and send him no god has to raise that person and in the raising there is a delegation of the spirit now we will see as we read the letters of uh, timothy and uh, titus we are going to see delegation in process see today we one of the things we we people fail in our christian life is we fail to raise up people okay and in some, a lot of us fail to raise up our own children in our families as uh, uh, as delegates to the kingdom delegates means ambassadors to the kingdom to whom we can we can give the responsibility share the responsibility initially then hand it over fully then see uh, encourage them from the side by garnering support for them and then setting them up and then enabling them to find uh, delegates to delegate it to you know this is the cycle of the church it is uh, it is preached and followed in management but it comes from the church so ephesians is another church he is writing to but this this is a, like a good news uh, letter why in the in the 1850s uh, there were so many immigrants to america and because um, there was a lot of uh, economic downturn people were dying of disease and you know med medicine was not at its peak and things like that there used to be many orphans orphans in the us and one big reason was also because of immigrants coming in and children losing their parents to various sicknesses many were single parents abandoned where the women remarried and went on with their lives you know all those kind of things these children used to be hiding in the valleys and 
uh, you know, hiding in the in the gullies. I mean, not valleys, in the alleys, alleys, and you know, uh, and having their own life of, of poverty. So during that time, there was something called an orphan train that was organized in the 1850s, and this train ran from 1850 to 1939. Uh, 1930, you know, almost like 80 years, this train traditionally was going. So what they used to do is there were 100,000 orphans in, in the 1850s in the US. So they put all these orphans into this train. This is called the orphan train. And people were told in various cities, this train would pass through from the north to the south. You know, it would go like that and come. So as it does its circular route, it would stop in various stations. And many places, the stations were getting built as the trains were moving in. You know. So in those places, uh, as they stopped, people could adopt any child. You know, they, you could just go through the windows and look at children and adopt them. And parents used to welcome uh, these children, welcome to your home. You know, what a kind of feeling it gives to these children. These children who are abandoned, have no one to care for, no one to call their own, would suddenly be received into good homes. And this was done by a good intention. And who has done this? Who has done this? This is uh, one minute. Let me give you the name. I got the name here. This is a person called uh, Charles Loring Brace. Charles Loring Brace, a 26-year-old pastor. A 26-year-old pastor gave this idea. And uh, it was followed till the 1929. 1929, the train did its last round. You know, and there were very few orphans on the train. So, um, you know, this train became a source of telling people, uh, telling the children, you have hope. It became a source of telling parents who had no children or who lost their children to say that you also have hope. You know, and so that is what is the mood in Ephesus today. So he's writing to Ephesus, telling them that you have hope. And the good news is that we have been adopted into the family of God. He's talking about a new relationship with God, how it is so important that God is actually welcoming you with that play card and say, welcome home. I, I got you, you're mine. You know, he, his, his, his realistic claim that is lavished over our lives is, is articulated in the book of Ephesians. And it is such a powerful book. And Ephesians talks about everything. Uh, and there's a, there's a phrase that resounds in Ephesians. It's called put in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. In Christ is the resounding phrase. So in the book of Ephesians, it's God is actually telling each one of us today that I've put you in Christ. You're safe. Don't worry. You're provided for. Don't worry. You will be healed. Don't worry. You know, God has put us in Christ. You know, uh, for us to be seated with Christ in the heavenlies, somebody has to put us into him, though, though we were engrafted into Christ. So these are all transactional for us to understand how the process goes about. But God has literally done that for us on the cross. So the good news is that we have been adopted into the family of God. The feeling of being orphaned or depressed or lost without a purpose should be over when anybody reads and understands Ephesians. So, you know, to people who are lonely, give them the book of Ephesians, sit with them. It's only four chapters, sit with them and help them to read it. Six chapters, uh, sit with them and help them to read it, you know. So this would be a blessing to them. In Ephesians uh, 3, 18, 19, in Ephesians 3, chapter 8, 18, 19, uh, he's, he's explaining to us about what is the height and the, uh, the depth and the breadth and the width on the faithfulness of God's love. You know, this is, a, this is an important thing. So as we read through that, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints, all the saints, including the believers, all the saints to grasp how wide and long, high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So he's telling we have been adopted into the family of God, not just that. We are being filled uh, to the fullness of God. Please don't try to understand anything lesser 
is what he, Paul is explaining here. And uh, he is talking about the spiritual blessings that are kept for us in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, and 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 21, he's talking about God. You know, I explained to you yesterday the acronym God, G O D, where God has given us a guarantee in Christ Jesus. He's, he's given us the Holy Spirit as a, with a sense of ownership, and he has deposited the Spirit in us as a as a as a deposit guaranteeing our ownership uh, and our inheritance in Christ Jesus you know so this is the beauty of uh, the spiritual blessings that we have been kept in Christ Jesus and he says you don't need any other spiritual blessing once you have this you don't need it see the kind of contentment that it brings to you knowing that Christ alone is sufficient this is this is the message that Paul is giving out in Ephesians he is also writing about being made alive in Christ. So these are all practical living, you know, being alive in Christ. If you know the truth of how one is alive, how does one get into the abundant life of John 10? 10? How is it that we are alive in Christ Jesus? He's, he's writing that letter to the church in Ephesians. So whenever he is appreciating, he's progressing in his teaching and doctrine and uh, taking that church forward. But when there are crises, he dashes off letters of correction and in correction, admonishing them with the correct doctrine and, uh, and reining them in if they go off on a tangent of tr traditions and you know ways of people. So he's talking about the unity, uh, one in Christ. He's talking about how we are all one in Christ. This is conceptual. Then he's talking about unity in the body of Christ, how we should live in that oneness. You know, so these are important things Every church is going through. Every Protestant church, every Catholic church is going through. In spite of that, it's possible that we, we miss our mark because religion has a, a big role to play and uh, relationship has been pushed into the background in every religion. You know, So that is where the danger of uh, religion lies. And Jesus Christ was... Uh, the, the crucifixion of Christ um, is... Um, is a very powerful example for us in history where Christ is destroyed, he's crucified by men of his own religion, where they, they knew what he was coming against. He was coming against organized religion because God never organized religion. He organized them as a family of who he was the king. Then they rejected him as king. He gave them worldly kings. And then everything started getting institutionalized. They weren't even following the instructions of the father. The, the instructions that God was giving them. Uh, and in spite of bringing upon those instructions, the status of a law and statute and precept, they were violating it. So Paul is talking about how to live in unity in the body of Christ. Then he's, he's explaining about how to live as children of the light and how we should not compromise with the world. And uh, his, one of his uh, important things we see here in, uh, in chapter 6, is about how wives and husbands should relate to each other, how children and parents, how slaves and masters. He's explaining that even in Timothy also, but he's uh, explaining how we should be related to one another, how we should be patient, accepting, kind and loving and gentle to one another. And, uh, and finally, he's talking about the armor of God, which is an important thing. It's not like a doctrine, but it is for us to understand. Many of us apply it like doctrine. You put on the helmet of salvation. This will not happen to you. That will... No, if you understood what is salvation and you're standing in that, it's as good as you putting on the helmet. You know. So Paul is giving you the picture to understand about the fortitude that one needs. And uh, that is why... It is not that you, we have to put on one by one, you know, you know, in, you know not in that sense. That becomes religion. And you, uh, every time we get attacked and we, we, something goes wrong, we, we start sensing, attributing it to the evil one and say, maybe I didn't put on the belt, you know, maybe I didn't put on the uh, breastplate of righteousness. It's, it's, that's a good way to analyze oneself. But you should not think that, you know, God is going to leave you uh, un, uh, unarmed because you're unarmed, you're going to be, uh, exposed to any kind of uh, attack by the devil. So one needs to know that these are doctrines which Paul wants us to understand. He wants us to understand the breastplate of righteousness and what is the righteousness that comes from Christ. So in any place, whenever any of my self-righteousness arises, we need to, one needs to put it down. And that is when you are putting on the breastplate. Okay, and not say, you know, declaring I'm putting on the breastplate of righteousness. <coughs> I'm putting on the belt of truth, you know. Not in that sense. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> so Paul is explaining uh, 
about the armor of God in Ephesians. So we'll move on to the book of Philippians. Philippians is also an upbeat letter. It is also a letter of joy because he, in every chapter, he is talking about joy and to rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because he is explaining to the church at Philippi, Philippi uh, what is the message of Christ, how he was joyful in spite of being in hardship and in circumstances, how Jesus faced every kind of injustice, persecution, and death, and yet Christ did not lose his joy. So Paul is also talking about it. He is talking about how he is facing injustice, persecution, and death. And um, at this time, when Philippians was there, it is probable that Paul was chained to um, chained in at his feet, you know, and he had a soldier watching over him. So Paul is uh, talking about uh, everything. I I want to give you all the same blessings that I have, except the chains. You know, the chains that are put to me, he goes on to say. So he was trying to <laughs> evangelize the soldier also who was watching <laughs> over him, you know. So Paul never wasted an opportunity. If they put him in prison, he was evangelizing to the prisoners. If they put him in house arrest and kept a soldier watch over him, he was evangelizing the soldier. And in all of this, he was doing it with a joyful attitude. So that was challenging to the people who faced Paul. From where was he getting this joy? So many scholars believe this message came when Nero was tossing Christians to the lion and burning them as human torches. So Paul was living in those times. And finally, uh, Nero doesn't, Paul doesn't get a proper trial in history, you know, and he was, uh, and Nero being the madman, he is to sentence so many people to death and Paul is also uh, beheaded which is not part of the letters that Paul has written. But in all these letters, as it comes to Philippians and Timothy and Titus, you will start seeing Paul is in the mood of bidding farewell. That means in his spirit, uh, he is in his late 50s. He's coming to know that his life is coming to an end. He's not worried about it. The person who has seen Christ on his conversion experience in Damascus is not worried about death. That is very, very significant. Of a, of a Christian, of the transformative work of Christ in, in a Christian. So Paul goes on to, Paul is talking about the essence of the letter is God can turn even the darkest moment in history. The darkest moment was Jesus being crucified, the darkest moment in history, and how God can turn it into the glory uh, of his kingdom, into the glory of the cross. That is what Paul is explaining in Philippians. It is a letter about rejoicing, okay? Paul's chains advance the cause of the gospel. He's telling any, whether I'm chained or I'm free, the gospel is unbound. That is important. So the gospel should not be slowed down, nor it should stagnate because of whatever is happening to us. You know, so uh, that is very important. Then he's talking, uh, he explains in Philippians about imitating Christ's humility. See, all these things are uh, emergence of the church. As the church is emerging, He's writing off various letters to various churches. But in all of this, there, there is a rule book. There is a canon law that is emerging, which is largely there in the Catholic Church today. So he's building Timothy and Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus and Timothy are two people he's delegating to. Epaphroditus is given to work with Timothy. And Paul is talking about not putting any confidence in the flesh. And now, you know, he's being conceptual, pressing on toward the goal, keep your goal goals in sight don't kind of divert from these things in all these things keep analyzing and keep your eyes on the goal you know don't um, turn back till you win the prize and he <clears throat> and he has a lot of exhortations uh, excellent uh, exhortations to us i can do all things through christ which strengthens me uh, and in philippians 4 4 he's talking about rejoice in the lord uh, always whatever may be the circumstances. So how can Paul write a letter like this? What was Paul filled with? That was what he was spilling. Gospel means go and spill. Go and spill what? Go and spill what you're filled with. So Paul was a person filled with the love of Christ. So even in his tough letters, you will see his love manifesting. You know, uh, it is typical of the Old Testament where God was speaking in his anger, but it is a manifestation of his love. And uh, see how that Old Testament is getting translated into the new. Here, Paul is beginning to bear in his body and in his mind the burden of being a father, a father of so many churches. Yes. In the Old Sorry. Testament, the Old Testament, there was no concept of love at all. In the 
no you don't uh, yeah yeah the uh, he, god is talking about love especially the book of isaiah is about how god has drawn us to himself with love and uh, that is between all... god and god and people yes but then yeah. generally uh, otherwise uh, love as a base uh, the way uh, you know paul is in the religion in the religion uh, there was no because the priest never loved the people and you know they 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 were just in their duties people mm-hmm. used to sin and bring uh, offerings and sacrifices to the priest as the duty they never they never had fellowship in that sense with the priest the priest would just read out the law and say okay this is what you have done then this is what you have to do okay and the uh, and the priests were just uh, offering the sacrifices mechanically to god without re- really being uh, concerned about the conversion in the heart of the people so there was yeah you're right so there was no that kind of a love over these people even ezra and nehemiah when you read it is uh, it, it is a feeling that they had for the people which was love i agree but after seeing the persecution and the kind of suffering that uh, each empire which was devastating them was inflicting upon them and then they are coming in more into a sense of duty towards god than actually loving their fellow brethren and that is why god has to talk later on in the minor prophets he has to talk about how injustice has been done to people even though you are keeping the word of god or the law of god they really don't keep it in the essence yeah. okay so you're right you're right now here uh, christ has completed the message you know it is finished his impartation to his apostles is completed so when somebody slaps you on the cheek you turn the other cheek you never reply back with wrong for uh, uh, for uh, for anything yeah. that is meted yeah. out wrong mm-hmm. yeah so at this point we will take a quick pause because we'll have to move on to colossians okay and uh, <clears throat> any questions related to what we discussed just now we can ask uh, clarify that now if uh, you can raise your voice as raise your hand sorry yeah mm-hmm. sheril sheril please yeah yeah it's not about what was spoken today but more uh, something that was said yesterday that is kind of bothering me okay if, uh, if it is not uh, you're not uh, if i understand that the church is, uh, doesn't make it a compulsory thing to tithe but if the laity doesn't you know give to the church how do our priests who've given up everything mm. you know uh, for themselves as in how how does they, how do they have food on the table or all their other needs yeah yeah that's a, a, a question even that came to my mind that somebody would ask uh, yesterday after uh, clarifying that see the beauty is in freedom so the catholic church does not insist on the tithe so if somebody is teaching the tithe that you have to bring the tithe to the uh, church offering in catholic church then it is a wrong teaching because the church, catholic church does not insist on the tithe in spite of that god is seeing the church on its way forward all right so what does it mean it means the largely the church is trusting on god to provide now so that may not be the argument of the others the others say you have institutions and all of that and for you somewhere it is getting subsidized somewhere you have plenty somewhere you have scarcity and you move the funds to plenty and scarcity there's a rationing there is leadership there is hierarchy everything is overseen and all of that they will say and say we are not like that so we have to insist on the time so it is not about that so the basic thing is uh, even our priests they don't uh, come to the church uh, become priests or any nun for that matter i'm talking largely okay uh, in their calling they don't come thinking that you know the faithful will provide they only come serve to serve the lord knowing god will provide okay so we have a christian duty to contribute but what is it that you'll contribute see whatever our contribution is it comes from our surplus that's what jesus did when he's sitting in the t- at the temple offering so what is he doing he's observing how, how people are putting everybody is putting from their surplus and he looks at this lady who's giving everything so what is the message here? the message is nothing of we should live our lives our lifestyle has to come to a point where nothing really belongs to us no we belong to the lord completely but today there is so much of clamoring for what is ours and the sense of tithe is once i give 10% the 90 belongs so those are some of the things that one needs to think about and uh, uh, now it's 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 not an easy decision to make but let me tell you uh, 
uh, of a personal experience. Once you are able to make that decision, you means not you specifically, anybody. Once anybody is able to make that decision, Lord, whatever I have belongs to you. Okay. Whatever I have belongs to you. I mean it in that little sense and help me to live that way. You will see that after that, uh, you, your, uh, the need for uh, our daily needs, the way the Lord meets it and the way we have uh, attachment to things or claim over things, everything changes. You know, God will take you through that transformation. That is the, that is the teaching that we should come to eventually. Uh, but once we stick to the teaching of the law, that is the tithe, we are going to give this and, you know, the other 90 belongs to us and God will give us pressed down, shaken, you know, overflowing. That is about mercy. That work, uh, Jesus is teaching about mercy. Unfortunately, that is taken and given to in the tithe also. You know, Jesus is teaching the same measure it was measured. You measure it out to others, it will be given to you, pressed down, filling, shaken, uh, shaken, filled and overflowing. That is about mercy. Jesus wants us to give mercy to others. But that is also brought into the teaching of the tithe. So what the point is that first and foremost, the Catholic Church does not insist on a percentage and things like that, which is the right teaching, right way forward. Second thing is, uh, today why that has become prominent is uh, because people, uh, both in ministry as well as uh, in institutionalized churches, I'm not bringing any denomination here, I'm just telling in general, people have become dependent on money for uh, ministry and everything is being attributed to money. That means we're not able to do gospel work because we don't have money. But was it that, was that the criteria in the early church? No. It's spurted a group, not because it had surplus money. No. So one of our popes, I think Pope Innocent XII or somebody, he said the church will no longer say uh, silver and gold, I, I, I have none. Today we have enough silver and gold. That is, he, he was not a right pope. He was brought into correction later. But that's a statement he made just there in history. So what am I saying is somewhere in the, in the institutionalizing of relationship of God, it has become religion again. Not I'm, I'm not I'm not accusing the church of anything. That is the way we are seeing the struggle of Paul. What is Paul's struggle? The religion. Religion is emerging in every place. The religion is playing up over, over uh, the administration of God's kingdom. So, ad so are we able to administer God's kingdom? Yes, we are able to administer. Why was uh, uh, Stephen appointed? He was appointed for administration. But today, various cultures are tearing into. So that is the that has been the struggle of the church, and the church is a is a body of Christ which is uh, under so much of affliction and yet not gone down. So that shows the resilience of the church, the power of the Holy Spirit, and God's time and again reviving it through his word. So keep close to the word, and uh, not that we should not give to the church, you know, not in that sense. Can we live as though everything belongs to the church? That is, that is the challenging question, because the lady gave her last two coins. Would we give that? Yeah. Or should we, would we say, let God bring me to that place where I will have my last two coins I will give. That is, uh, that is defiance. We should not, uh, that's not the attitude. The attitude is, can we live like that? And that is why he, uh, from adultery being practiced, Jesus tells, if it comes in your mind itself, you are committed adultery. So what is Jesus actually doing? He's raising the bar to the point of its essence. What is it? So what do, what do we give to God? 10%? No, man, we can't give anything. Everything belongs to him. Technically. Actually, everything belongs to him. Can we live as everything belongs to him? That is the question. Mm. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, my personal uh, experience, uh, I have been actually doing this ten uh, percent thing uh, in for many years. In yeah. fact, I have a, I have an Excel sheet also to just to <laughs> set to the calculation right. Yeah. But uh, you know, I, in this in the entire you know span of time when mm. I was giving. I never, rather, God never inspired me to go and share about this 10% thing, uh, you know, to anybody for that matter. Mm. But mm. later I was corrected, as you rightly said, you know, my uh, attitude was very wrong in that 10% giving because I always felt mm. a right, self-righteous attitude because I'm giving what the, that 10%, you know, of tithe. So yeah. that was wrong. I was corrected. I was uh, thoroughly corrected. And today, I, uh, you know, I am convinced of this fact. It mm. is, uh, as you rightly said, that, uh, you know, church does not insist on 10%. Yeah. Actually, uh, you know, uh, 
if you have to give we give 100% yeah okay, 100% or even if you don't give anything it is okay but whatever you are giving you give it in joy yeah. and that was uh, you know that is something which i learned and i mean rather lot taught me mm. i really uh, you know i would say i was humbled uh, to you know uh, to learn this because uh, for, uh, th- that giving of uh, 10% actually put uh, many of uh, us in that self righteous attitude which is yeah. wrong and yeah. you rightly said uh, you know one point which i i, I liked is that Uh, a, a priest or a nun do not join uh, the congregation expecting mm-hmm. lay people to support them mm-hmm. they uh, join the congregation they become a priest or a nun uh, you know on on the based on the providence that god is going to bless them with i think that is a great attitude you know there are so many priests so many nuns who live in utter poverty but with so much of joy in their heart Mm-hmm. and there are the priests and nuns who live the other way also yeah. uh, but uh, you know nobody uh, i i don't think any of those uh, priests and nuns who live in the poverty mm-hmm. ever complain the fact that we don't uh, you know have enough uh, yeah. there is uh, in that poverty they have the joy i think mm-hmm. that is uh, what uh, drives them to the uh, to be a part of this uh, missionary uh, yeah. another important thing is in the vow of poverty which they take up it is not that we will keep ourselves to the scarce minimum it is about sharing it is that when there is surplus they would like to give it to places where there is a need and so they say we will we maintain to that vow of poverty where we just have the bare minimum and we are happy with it and you know god has provided for them till today through us or through every any, anybody else and god is in the business of provision we will only see that uh, we will only see that when we step into that track okay but uh, uh, largely uh, the teaching of tithe and uh, see because there are three types of tithes which tithe you are going to give if you want to keep keep all the three tithes we, who are we to say that okay what i can i will do that is what god is telling you initially no he never demanded the tithe he said what you can you give and give cheerfully okay yeah. but i want you if you are not going to give yourself and going to give something in your substitute then um, then jesus has a little eyebrow raised you know he is wanting you and so that is the uh, essence you know okay we'll move on with colossians so in the first the colossians uh, colosse was a first century town it was a new town the danger of colossians uh, colosse church was that it, it colosse was a breeding ground for cults now paul is dealing with a new problem in the churches that can come in the in the, in the coming days what is that a corruption of the gospel or a proprietary ship of the gospel you know so where somebody an individual takes it into a lifestyle and things like that and then people start following that individual and they become a a cultic group secretive and just adhering to certain the norms and you know claiming some uh, great uh, visions and powers and uh, miracles just because they are part of this group you know that also uh, christianity also the new relationship with god also should not get branded as a cult because as it is it is facing opposition from the jews that opposition is mounting and uh, uh, the romans are beginning to see the way the way means the, the new uh, faith that is emerging they're beginning to see that as a challenge to them they don't know in what way it is a challenge these guys get beaten up they don't even uh, lift a finger back but somewhere their numbers keep increasing so they are beginning to see that as a challenge in all of these things there are um, there are, there are freelance guys who are trying to wheel deal the whole thing and try to transform it into a cult so the the challenge of colosse was it was on a major trade route like corinth it was vulnerable to various perverted ideas and thoughts with aberrations to the gospel there were many orients who were coming in from the east and they were bringing in their uh, traditions you know today also we have this uh, uh, what do you call traditional medicine you know somebody brings uh, something and gives like a tiger balm i'm just giving example okay i'm not against it or for it so people, we will immediately think they have put something of the tiger into the balm you know it must just be a name but because it comes from the orient we will think you know then they will be we'll ask them any part of the tiger is put in, you know and that person may not you know he may not have good product knowledge for the sales thing for the selling he will say yes and so we think it is special so you know these these ideas that were coming in from the orient were getting mixed with uh, uh, with the new religion kind of thing that the uh, the new religion status that was being bestowed onto the way of christ 
and how is this new religion status being bestowed? Everybody is pulling it in their cultural direction. And in Colosse, uh, a cultic setting was fast developing. So the danger of cults elaborating a new scheme inclusive of Christ was beginning. So what is this called? This is called deception. What they were doing, they were including Christ in their scheme of things and telling, okay, this is the way we should follow it. And if this is the way we should follow it, does it doesn't sound like various denominations? Yes, it sounds like that. Okay, so every man was becoming a law unto himself. He who had good knowledge of Christ was uh, tweaking it in his own uh, little way for their conveniences and including Christ in their scheme of things. You know, so Paul was declaring Christ is enough, the fullness of God, the reason anything exists. You know, so uh, when you say the reason anything exists, people can take that and flip it back and say, the reason evil exists also is because of Christ, you say. Yeah, we'll come to that. We'll come to the origin of evil when we are dealing with that on Thursday. So Paul says Christ is enough, the fullness of God. And he says you don't need all these uh, intermediary matters that you bring about in the, in, the way, in the way of culture, in the way of uh, traditions. Please don't bring that. So he's telling Jesus bridged the gap between God and man. So we, we don't need to approach God indirectly or through a ladder of angels or other gods. So they were using all these Old Testament things to make up their own little denomination or their own little faith box, you know. So put it in a box and then peddle it to people. And the simple people used to fall prey to that. So this is the challenge even today, you know. We're talking about conversions and things like that. And, and in some places, there has been uh, there has been inducement. I don't say no, but uh, we are sad for it. I mean, that's not the way we should uh, bring Christ across to people. All right. So maybe one or two stray incidents of inducement and people, uh, the whole thing is branded wrong. So that was the danger even in those days. So Paul says we can come to God boldly because of Christ. And... Uh, before Christ, it was a mystery as to how one could come to God. Now it is revealed in Christ. So he's talking about the curtain being torn and that he will explain in Hebrews, actually. Um, so he's talking about how we have access to Christ, access to God. We have access to his throne of grace and we can come boldly before him, all because of Christ. And we are coming in the sun. The fullness of God lived, died and came back from death in broad daylight. That's his, that's his glaring, blaring statement. The fullness of God lived in Christ, died in Christ, and came back from death in broad daylight. Why do you want any other counterfeit kind of uh, religion? That is his question. So in his teaching, uh, in his letter, uh, which is teaching, he's talking about the supremacy of Christ. Now, this is one of my favorites. This made me love Paul's work. But for a long time, for about uh, more than 12 years, I've been arguing and saying that this Paul, whatever he wrote, I didn't understand, you know, it's very complicated to understand. But one day uh, I was reading the supremacy of Christ and I'm going to read it for you. Eight verses. Okay. Chapter one, verse 15 to 23. So Paul is writing this huh? and he's writing to Colossians where many perverted ideas, aberrations are being brought in and people are willing dealing in their own individual scheme of things. They just add Christ in and explain that Christ is essential, you know, but Paul is changing this whole thing. He's throwing the whole thing out and he's explaining to them who is Christ. He's telling Christ, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. So people started making some kind of uh, uh, visible uh, things and, you know, uh, trying to do it in their own little way. And so he's telling, he is the image of the invisible God. The first born over all creation. The word born means brought forth, brought forth by God over all creation. That means before God created anything, he brought forth Christ through whom he is going to create. Okay, brought forth Christ from where? When no creation exists, from where will he bring forth? He will bring forth from himself. So Christ is in a sense God who brought forth Christ as a revelation over creation that through Christ all creation will come into existence. So verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Firstborn means the first brought forth from the dead. 
okay until then everything went bodily decay but the first one to be brought from forth from the dead without seeing decay is christ so the first born from the from the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy for god was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him and through him reconcile all things unto himself whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through the blood shed on the cross this is what uh, and he goes on to explain two more verses about the supremacy of christ so this is a powerful uh, correction that paul is bringing into the ideologies of the various churches that he established and each of these churches were trying to uh, keep away from the authority of the word so what is paul uh, writing to them letters he is bringing back the authority of the word to the place where jewish converts are there he is bringing back the authority of the word from the old testament through where there were gentile converts he is he is cautioning them and keeping the pristine um, message of the gospel and saying please don't taint it with your cultures and traditions you know so he writes about freedom from human regulations through life in christ what does freedom from human regulations mean see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy so in those days philosophy was a big thing and people were having different theories and different philosophies and that was a challenge also because everybody is trying to fit the newly emerging faith into their philosophy so paul is writing see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and on the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ for in Christ the fullness of the deity lives in human form in bodily form and you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority so uh, paul is uh, going on to explain all these things he gives rules for holy living he gives rules for christian households whenever he is talking about christian household he is talking about wife and husband children and parents slave and masters okay and he also gives instructions uh, to people whom he specifically naming now he is naming people like tychicus aristarchus mark barnabas demas nympha and archippus and you know for my personal thrill i made a list of these names and there are over 50 names 45 plus names but over 50 names whom paul personally impacted you know one day i was asking the lord you know what is going to be the impact of my life you know and uh, the lord was uh, just uh, you know uh, um, speaking spontaneously but in, in this area he specifically did not answer and for a thrill you know i was just seeing this man paul what a impact he had so i started to look at the make a list of the names paul had impacted and it amazed me that he had personally impacted over 50 people if i could you and me could have that kind of impact in our lives personally impact 50 people for the for the lord or disciple 12 people for the lord by taking care of them spiritually by being their spiritual parents and to be there for them it, it is an amazing uh, offering that we bring to the lord and it uh, it yields into the work of evangelism so this is about colossians colossians in a summary was to combat the cults okay so we are going into the second slide now that is uh, so after this second slide we'll take a quick break so this first thessalonians first and the second thessalonians are um, continuous letters uh, both written, written with a little gap so this letter gives us insight into paul's missionary approaches how he was uh, commissioning these churches how is he breaking ground what is his approach 20 years after the ascension of christ paul is on the scene what is he doing on the scene for the first 3 years he stayed in arabia we saw yesterday he stayed in arabia he had the scales in his eyes and he was waiting for the lord to lead him and after those 3 years in, in less than 17 plus years he's moved he's moving establishing churches so you know uh, what is the kind of approach he was using so this is uh, paul's approaches we are uh, given to read in between the lines of how paul's approaches were in establishing churches very important for those of us who want to establish people groups uh, teach them about christ and then move on from there you know we don't depend on those groups to support us or anything but having established them in the word and in the spirit we move on from there knowing that they have both the spirit and the word so paul's letter in first thessalonians is gentle and caring like a mother he praised the church for their strength 
first over their weaknesses and continually thank God for their spiritual progress. Okay, this is called parenting. So he's doing good parenting with the churches. One of the main things is after he started, he's always keeping in touch with the elders. He's keeping in touch with what is happening all through letters. Today we have this beauty of email. Instantly we receive but in those days, you know, people had to carry it across. But he used to wait eagerly for those letters. And people and used to write letters to them, uh, uh, painstakingly write letters to them. So Paul is has always uh, been a pioneer of missions like a parent. His approach is like a parent. That means he always has a fatherly approach. Something that is, uh, uh, that is very important for those of us who pioneer ministries. Okay, and it's been a big teaching ground for me too. So some had questioned Paul's motives. Many people were muttering in the churches and questioning his motives, saying that uh, he he takes on freelancers for a profit. You know, so uh, that that kind of accusation was that because he had Timothy, he had Barnabas, he had Titus assisting him, and uh, some of them were Jews, some of them were non-Jews, and you know. Uh, there was some kind of support being given to them. So people were trying to get into the support system because it was easy and they were questioning Paul. So Paul was explaining that he was a tent maker. He laboring for his own bread and his own meal. And he's explaining all of that in, in, in Thessalonians. And he says, I have to do this in order to avoid becoming a burden to you people. All right. And that is the attitude of the letter. The letter contains Paul's ministry uh, teaching to Thessalonica, his longing to see the Thessalonians. So he's the fatherly love is uh, exhibited there, how he longs to meet with them. For, uh, and then he's responding to Timothy's encouraging report. Timothy has come back from Thessalonica with an encouraging report. So he is uh, appreciating the church in Thessalonica that they're doing well in the areas that they are doing well. And he's uh, exhorting them to live, to please God. And uh, one important point is, the last point is the coming of the Lord. He's talking to them about the coming of the Lord because uh, a lot of people had become uh, doomsayers also. Okay, And that is leading to uh, the next part of Paul's letter, 2 Thessalonians. Paul's continuation of the previous letter gives instructions and insight into standing firm to be patient and ready uh, with practical living. That means as we wait for Christ, in the first letter of Thessalonians, Paul concludes by saying what kind of weight our weight should be. Our weight should be a weight of longing. We should be longing for the coming of Christ because the day of the Lord will not come upon us like a thief because we are children of the light. Paul goes on to explain. <coughs> because a lot of people were teaching, <coughs> a lot of people were teaching that the day of the Lord will come upon us like a thief. Okay, uh, rightfully so on those who are not expecting the Lord. But those of us who are waiting for him, the quality of our weight should be that of a longing. He goes on to explain. He's continuing in the second letter. And because people had entered the church, uh, doom saying that Christ said he will be back and he's going to come back soon. So people started quitting their jobs and, you know, getting into impractical living, just waiting, 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 you know, that kind of thing. So Paul is talking about practical living in our waiting. How does one wait practically for, for God to return, for Christ to return, and what kind of return it is going to be? So that was his letter of Second Thessalonians. So he's giving encouragement to Christians who are undergoing persecution in their faith. He's telling them, hold on, stand firm. We are going to go through this because this is what we signed up for, you see. So uh, in, in all this suffering, uh, Paul is talking about the pains we take, take up because we are co-redeemers. Paul does not use the word co-redeemer, but in a sense, he talks about how Christ is sharing the ministry with us. As we work in the ministry, we are sharing the pains of Christ. And in our body, we carry the uh, death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We're carrying the victory also, you know. So then he talks about how this kind of persecution will lead to a man of lawlessness. So he's talking about the end day because that end day has not come. So he's talking about how a man of lawlessness will come into the church. This is prophecy in Paul. He's talking about why this man of lawlessness will come and, uh, and he will cause something called a great abomination. And that is... Uh, corresponding with the, the vision of uh, Daniel, you know, how the great abomination will come. And uh, Paul is drawing attention to that and he's telling that is why he's bringing attention to that is these things have to happen for the end to come, you know. And today we, uh, today we may be in times such as that 
where uh, every kind of abomination is uh, is manifested in the world today and uh, you know we we really don't know how to deal with these abominations and a lot of them are challenging our faith as well you know right from being gay and right from being lgbtq and you know there are somebody told me there are 81 genders identified by the new uh, uh, kind of law there are some some genders are the, they're called personal genders you know uh, we can change our gender hour to hour that is also a gender you know so it be, depends upon how our mind state of mind is if our state of mind tells us right now that we are, have to be feminine so there are a few of us who think we are feminine so that kind of uh, um, you know i don't know whether you call it a development or you call it an aberration but that kind of thinkings are also there so every kind of lawlessness is manifested in today's age it was it had already begun in those days so paul is talking about standing firm in verses uh, in chapter 2 verse 15 and chapter 3 verse 6 he's talking about standing firm in what he's talking about the teachings and the traditions of the apostles paul is connecting it back to what the apostles have been teaching right across and he, how his teaching is connected with the mainstream apostles and he, he's talking about keeping to that teaching and the tradition there were some things that were not in writing they were followed by uh, oral uh, word of mouth they were followed by traditions he says keep to that don't develop your own and things like that so that's very important so and he takes about false teaching of the day of the lord so there were many doomsayers who you know even today i'm not blaming anybody but even today if somebody is preaching about the end times we all want to sit and listen so in those days these doomsayers were making a livelihood for themselves by preaching about the end time you know this is what is going to happen and i remember uh, meeting some people some years ago they were telling it will all be over by December this year. And, you know, they were coming in uh, being very abusive. And I had to call it a day and tell them not to come anymore. You know, that kind of Christians also I have seen who said the world is packing up by December of this year. And that was 2012, you know. So I don't know whether they were prophesying or talking about a movie, but all these things were there. So rumors and practical errors in waiting for the Lord, he's explaining in chapter 3. And then... Uh, he's actually in each of these chapters he's quietly praying for the Thessalonians so this is Paul's two letters Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians we'll take a quick break before we come to Timothy yeah, yeah. any any questions on uh, this meanwhile on uh, on the previous question which Sharila had asked I have shared a uh, 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 what uh, the church uh, teaches on Catechism of the Catholic Church 2043. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it starts with 2041, four, uh, one, which talks about uh, various uh, precepts. Yeah. And the fourth precept uh, says mm. uh, that, uh, the, not fourth, uh, the fifth uh, uh, precept says, uh, mm. you shall help to provide for the needs of the church. Means yeah. that faithful are ob obliged to assist with the material needs of the church. Yeah. Each according to his own ability. What a wonderful thing, no? Yeah. The faithful yeah. also have to have the duty of providing for the material needs of the church, each according to his own ability. So this is actually the church's stance, which means yeah. it is beyond the 10%. Yeah. That concept right. of old, con old Testament concept of 10%, you know, which we normally see it or hear it or sometimes we do it. So that is something which we need to, you know, get it out of our mind. Oh. But give beyond that. There is a beautiful article written in the, by the US, US Catholic congregation. Uh, uh, th giving is not just 10%, it's beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is, a, that is a very beautiful approach of the church. Church is not saying that you just give 10% and done with it. No. Church, mm -hmm. you know, that is, uh, that, that is what uh, I, uh, you know, interpret from this. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a beautiful point, Jose. Thank you for pulling that out from the CCC. One of the important things is what people have not understood is that whether it is the tithe or putting those two last copper coins into the box, what are we actually doing? We're talking about giving to God. How would you give? Would you give 10% and claim back and say, you know, I've done my bit or would you, uh, would you give? So what is the essence of our giving? The essence of our giving is only representative when we give in material. It, representative of what? Representative of we giving ourselves. We're basically telling the Lord, Lord, I am yours. I am available. But right now, this is what I'm doing. 
and I, I want you to work with me, Lord, and take me wherever things are available, wherever you have need for me, take me there. That's what we are saying. But what it what is happening is from giving, it is coming down to a level of offering. You know, okay. In the Catholic Church, there is a beautiful teaching of communion. And if you look at the liturgy, the liturgy is just before the communion. As the communion activity starts, what goes around the offering bag? Okay, okay, we put our little cast and paisa and that. But forget about that. What do you see in the offering? People bring fruits. Sometimes people bring pencils and books. They, sometimes they bring a shawl. Sometimes they bring vegetables. Some, they, they bring like, that is what you can bring to the Lord whatever you want, but you are still representative in your giving. So why is it during the time of the communion activity? It is because God is giving himself to us. How does he give? He gives 10%. He gives himself to us fully. And how are we supposed to respond? We are supposed to respond by giving ourselves to God fully. Mm. Whatever it, it is only representative in giving, whether we are giving materially or we are giving by kind, we are just representatively giving. What are we communicating to God personally? Mm. We are telling Lord, I am available. Just like how you are giving yourself body and blood to me. I am giving myself. That is why it is called communion. Our offering, that means our giving and Christ's giving. Christ is offering himself. He is giving himself our meeting. That is communion. That is the liturgy. It comes after the word, after the teaching of the word. That means I have heard and now Christ is ministering himself. How is he ministering? He is putting the towel around his waist and he is coming down to serve me. How? By giving himself to me. How should I respond by giving himself? You know, so so when I when I say I will stick to my ten percent, I am basically calling upon the law that I will keep the law. Yeah. Okay. So, so we'll anyway. move on. We will move on. Uh, then we'll take the questions. Yeah. Yeah. So we come to First Timothy. Timothy is a letter of delegation. It is an example here where Paul has developed his next line. Paul has developed the next line of leadership, and he is bringing it to Timothy. So Timothy is born of a Jewish mother and a Greek father. So Timothy didn't have problems in the Jewish communities where Paul was sending him to. So Paul's rugged years of ministry, stonings, beatings, and jailings has brought upon, brought him an attitude which he's, which he's teaching Timothy. Okay, And he's teaching Timothy um, how, to be, how to live in that Christian attitude. And very rightfully, Timothy, because he's, delegate, he's going to delegate to two people, Timothy and Titus. Titus he is going to send to non-Jewish churches because Titus is a non-Jew and uh, uh, the Jewish churches raised objection and he's going to say, I'm going to send Titus also. But, you know, he knows where to send whom. But uh, it is not that being diplomatic, you know. So I can send Titus to a non-Jewish church. He'll be more effective than No, Titus should be accepted everywhere because he's a Gentile convert and people were insisting on his circumcision and all that. So coming to Timothy, Timothy was Paul's man Friday. That means for any work, he was referring to Timothy. He was dispatched whenever there was any crisis in Thessalonica or Corinth. And uh, he developed a father and son relationship uh, in the work of the gospel. So that means Paul was a church father. Okay, He always had a fatherly affection for the churches he established. For the leadership, he admonished them as a father. And even the upbringing of the next level of leadership for him, for him to delegate to hand on the pattern to people, he was developing them as a father-son relationship. And wherever Th Paul went, Timothy loyally followed. So this was Paul's uh, development in Timothy. In the first uh, letter, Paul is uh, Timothy is being sent to Ephesus as a pastor. Okay, why? Because there were loose and immoral behavior in the church with false doctrines. So, like how we saw previously, people were wheeling dealing. You know, wheeling dealing means trying to um, bring in our own little thing and, you know, our own little kinks and curves to uh, what is there without really making some large changes. From the outside, it will appear like a nice church, but inside they were tweaking it to their own con uh, comfort. So, Timothy was sent as a troubleshooter, but he was sent in a pastoral capacity. So, uh, Paul addresses issues of lowly paid staff. There are, see now, all these things come. Just what we read, you know, the CCC, lowly paid staff. Many people were not even uh, having a proper livelihood and they were serving in the church selflessly, quietly. So, Paul is observing all of that and uh, writing to people that we, have, we need to take care of them. There were generation gaps. 
there were tussles between the young and the older generations and the younger generation was getting ignored. So Paul is addressing the generation gaps. There was integrity deficit. That means people were cutting corners quietly. So Paul is uh, writing to Timothy and telling him to look into those areas. There was abuse of social aid. See, everything that we hear about today is was happening there. There was the love of money which was taking over. There were unruly women in the congregation, important people with their hairstyles and with their modern dresses and things like that. And they wouldn't want to come under any authority. So Paul had to deal with that. And there were leadership standards, which were having double standards. You know, if somebody is rich and affluent, you know, they could go get away with anything. And, uh, you know, the policies and rules and regulations were meant for the people who, who could it, it to be lauded over. No? So policies regarding widows, slaves and the rich, all of this is there in First Timothy. So what is Paul trying to do? He is trying to send a person with uh, instructions to be followed. Now, and when Timothy gets there, Timothy just has to uh, give the letter and say, I'm coming under the authority of Paul and dad is upset with you. And uh, you guys, uh, he's asking me to look into these areas. So the letter is establishing Timothy's groundwork for him. You know, So Timothy gets him there and he can straight away come on to the issues directly. In the second letter of Timothy, uh, Paul is changing his tone because Paul knows very soon he's going to die. And he wants to kind of hand over to Timothy. So he's looking at Timothy as a successor. And he's talking about handing over the pattern. So Paul is expressing sadness, confidence in Timothy, nostalgia over how he's been uh, uh, holding these churches in his dreams, in his prayers. And, uh, and he's talking about some grave concerns that he has about these churches. That means areas of correction in these churches that are still pending. So Paul is lecturing Timothy like an army sergeant at, at certain times in 2 Timothy. And he's commanding him to stand firm, overcome shame, hold on to the faith. Because sometimes when you're implementing correction, um, we can be open to ridicule um, from, from affluent people. And, uh, and they can cause political swings within the groups there. Uh, sometimes he's breaking into a fatherly mood uh, with uh, Timothy and telling him, you know, sometimes he's acting like an army general, you know, giving him straight, strict uh, instructions. Sometimes he's breaking into a fa fatherly mood. So Paul is using this last opportunity to communicate to Christian workers to inspire and challenge his associate Timothy. So that letter can be used today also as a communication to Christian workers. You know, how we should not abuse aid, how we should minimize on what we draw and what we need for ourselves, how we don't need to store up for tomorrow. All of that can be taught into Christian living. Store up for tomorrow means not making a savings account. Keep a savings account, but don't make that the treasure of your life. You know, then that is where our heart will be. That is a beautiful teaching I came in with Father John that time, you know what uh, Joe sent me. It, it reveals Paul's loneliness and suffering. See, some of these burdens, though there is Timothy, Titus, Barnabas, Mark, Aristarchus, Epaphroditus, so many people are there. Some of these things he's telling, I cannot share it. No. Uh, 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 when I try to share it, it still stays with me because that's his burden. And he's talking about bearing it in a lonely way. And the, the letter is talking about such thing. There is a tone in the letter and Paul is insisting on relying on scripture and living a life of discipline, a useful framework for us today. So we, our reliability should be on scripture and what the teachings of the church, uh, because uh, that is where our framework lies. Otherwise, our lives will become loosey-goosey. We'll become an army of one, you know, each man a law unto himself, you know, and all of that. One of the things that uh, uh, the Lord spoke to me is also not to have a group, group of people following me. And that is something that I have been successful at having nobody follow me and I'm pointing everybody to Christ and I, I take joy in doing that. <clears throat> so in Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul has a beautiful word here. <clears throat> he says in Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, <clears throat> so he's talking about, he says, <clears throat> my son Timothy, <clears throat> be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrusted to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. What is he telling? He's telling Timothy to raise up your second line. He's telling Timothy, I want you also to start delegating, my friend. I want you also to find people in the Lord whom God will give you, faithful people. You look out. So that should be our lookout today. 
as pioneers in God's work or as people who are working in his harvest, we should be always on the lookout for possible harvesters. Recommend them to the Lord and say, Lord, this is a wonderful person you've given me, Lord. I don't know how to start the topic with him. Lord, uh, would, you, would you put on him, Lord, the burden of establishing people groups for you? of people looking to you, you know? So you start up, you start developing that into a prayer discipline. <clears throat> and Paul is teaching Timothy that. And in, in, verse, uh, in, 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 in verse 15, he's talking about uh, how you should look for these people. What is the efficiency you should look for in people like that? He's talking about a workman who does not need to be ashamed. That's the kind of person you should look for. And who correctly handles the word of truth. That means not only ashamed to do the work of Christ, okay, many a times it is washing the feet. And uh, attitudinally, it is always you keep in attitude washing of feet only, okay? Uh, not uh, sitting like a, a, a big person in authority. Always the attitude is to wash the feet. Corrected attitude means to transform the attitude is to be in a feet washing attitude always. And so he also says rightly handling, rightly dividing the word of truth. That means a person who's seasoned with the word. How does one become seasoned with the word? Reading the word again and again and asking God, I didn't understand this. I don't agree with this Lord. I struggle with this Lord. Help me. No, that's your wrestling with the word. That is your penual moment with the Lord. And the Lord will give you a breakthrough and then take you to the next level. Again, there is a new struggle, a breakthrough, next level. You know, that's how one grows with the Lord. So Paul is telling Timothy to look out for people like that. And uh, then he gives some instructions. He says, Demas has deserted me and gone off to... So there were some kind of rebels, you know, who are becoming a law unto themselves and saying, okay, I've trained in enough under Paul. Now I want, to, I want to kind of venture out on my own. Demas was one person like that. So he, he, he refers to names of people he's impacted. Okay, he's talking about Crescens, Titus, Mark, Tychicus, Carpus, Alexander the harmful, he calls him. Alexander is a fellow who gave, you trouble, gave me trouble, Timothy. Look out because Alexander can give you also trouble. So he's... He's mentioning that in writing. Huh? He doesn't. He's not uh, making uh, bones of it. He's explaining that. So Priscilla, Aquila, Erastus, Trophimus, Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, and Claudia. I, I put these names because you know I I I, I, I like doing that work for myself. So that is so that is about Timothy. So Timothy is Paul's second line, and Paul is bringing him into authority. Put what is this letter? This letter is a mantle over him. Okay, it is the mantle of uh, Elijah over Elisha. Yeah. And that is typical of the apostles placing their hands over Paul and commissioning Paul. So Paul is become the apostle. Now he's commissioning others, all right? So how can we commission people in our lives? We need to pray for these people. God will send these people, okay? I'm going to take five more minutes and finish this, and then we'll have our questions, okay? So... Now, next, Paul's next uh, lieutenant or next assistant is a person called Titus. Very short letter to Titus. Paul is dispatching Titus to a congregation in Crete. Titus is on a mission to Crete, to a church in Crete. Okay, what is the problem? The town was inhabited by five ethnic groups. So five ethnic groups, you know, people from all over the diaspora, including Samaritans, including Gentile Jews, including Gentiles, including Romans. A lot of Romans were slave Romans, you know, people, slave population. That means some of them who, who were set free or some of them who were country, slave community was also there. Now, all of these people come with various personality levels. And there was, because of that, these people are all in the church. The beauty is the church accepts everybody. <laughs> You know, the church is not discriminating and accepting everybody. But once they come in, the church is having challenges. You know, how, how do you deal with a person who, who, who is from a slave mentality? You know, he's, he's always going to be withdrawn into himself. How do you bring him into the fullness of what God has planned for him? So Titus was a non-Jew. Okay. And he had become a fully committed Christian. So Paul is writing to Titus how to handle a difficult assignment. And given the settings of sometimes you have Jewish audiences also you're going to deal with. So he's giving practical theology in the letter of Titus. Older men and uh, older women, younger men and younger women and slaves. All of them are groups into themselves. So it's like this, you know, in today's church also we may see all the people in the cars will talk to people in the cars. The people in two-wheelers will talk to people in two-wheelers. You know, largely it is... It's become like that. And that was the, uh, there also, you know, they were, they were, there were groups 
and Paul is trying to diffuse these groups, which is he wants them all to have fellowship, including the slaves. Huh? Next letter, Philemon, uh, we're going to read about uh, the story of a slave. So uh, Paul is doing that. And uh, in Timothy and Titus, Paul had truly developed um, leadership and he had delegated to them. Okay. So what is uh, what do you find in Titus? In the letter of Titus, Titus has a task, task to do on Crete, to go and set right the conflict between these ethnic groups. And within these ethnic groups, younger people and uh, older generation, they had conflicts. And the slaves had no conflicts. They were ignored and they were uh, taken for granted. So what must be taught to various groups? You know, to those who had some kind of superiority complex, you had to teach humility. To those who had inferiority complex, you had to pull them up into the fullness of what Christ wants to do with them. You know, you've got to boost their morale. And uh, Paul is talking about doing what is good. So it's a very short letter uh, in Titus. So he's commissioning Titus also in a certain way. Okay. And uh, Paul wants to uh, Titus to move on. Though he's not sending Titus as a pastoral capacity, he's sending him off to, to sort out some troubles in Crete. Now we come to the last letter for today. He's talking to Philemon. Now, Philemon is a slave owner. This is there is a little story here which makes it easier for us. Paul is writing to the owner of a slave. Why is he writing to the owner of a slave? Because the slave has run away. Okay, the slave has run away. And in those days, in the under the Roman law, slavery was under the Roman law. There was no slaves under Jewish law. There was no slaves under Greek law. The slavery was existent under Roman law. And because Rome was ruling through all those areas, slavery was common. So people taking slaves and um, having them for li life, all of that was very common. The problem was when the slaves wanted to be free, you know, so a slave has to earn his or her freedom. And it is not an easy thing. Most slaves couldn't earn their freedom. So there was the slave called Onesimus. He had run away. He had been caught. And he probably was in the same prison with Paul when Paul was in the jail. And Paul had shared the gospel to him. And Onesimus, the slave, had become a believer. Now, Paul realized that, uh, recognizes that Onesimus ran away and that complicated the issue. Onesimus was a runaway slave. He was a hunted fugitive because the order of the day was many slaves used to run away. That used to be the order of the day. And what used to happen when these fellows ran away, there were bounty hunters. People used to go and look for these slaves and bring them back, get a reward from the masters. And the slaves many times used to be put to death or they used to be handicapped, you know, they used to, some kind of corporal punishment was given. So uh, this Onesimus was hiding and uh, these slaves can't get onto ships and, uh, and even in ships, they was, would be betrayed. If they try to get onto ships quietly by saying, you know, we work for free and you just give me some food and get me onto another land and all that. Many times the ship will start, but in between there'll be wheeling dealing happening. Somebody will tweak the deal and betray the slave for a sum of money. So slaves were never safe, especially the runaway ones. So, uh, Onesimus could be executed when if he returns because as per the law, his owner had to turn him in and say, you know, this is the slave I complained about who went missing. He's found. So I guess the law has to take its course. So when Onesimus con converted to Christ, his case became complicated and uh, Paul is taking up a responsibility like a father. Now he's writing a letter to Philemon. Philemon is the master of Onesimus. So that's a beautiful letter. It's a single chapter. And we should uh, all read it sometime later. So Paul's, uh, Paul is talking about his obvious close relationship with Philemon. He's telling, see, Philemon, I know you. And you are like a brother to me. And I want you to, you know, I'm like a father to you. I want you to understand where I'm coming from. You know, so Paul is using his personal influence over Philemon. Onesimus could have been friends with Paul when they shared a jail cell together. Onesimus agrees to turn himself to the owner. Paul is mentioning that saying that should be welcomed because this can come only if somebody is not afraid of the consequences and not of not fearful so he's telling on his, uh, he's telling philemon see this man who ran away from you wants to come back to you so i want you to consider him as a special case and what is that special case paul is pushing his luck here and he's telling philemon can you accept him i'm asking for a miracle can you accept him as you accept me that means if I turn myself to you, would you hand me over to the authorities? 
don't do that. You wouldn't do that, would you? Can you do that to Onesimus? That is, this is a personal letter of Paul. So what, why is this letter should find its way in the Bible? It is because it is teaching us how to deal with people who serve us. Now, I have a quick uh, testimony here. Uh, uh, some years ago, when, when my daughter was born, I'm talking about the 2002 to 2010, for those eight years, we had somebody who was living in with us, helping us, you know, we never could call her a maid. She was a, a skinny, dark person. She had come to be with us because of problems in her family. And she was living with us. You know, what was my biggest challenge? My biggest challenge was, I was thinking, Lord, now I'm a new believer. How can I bring her up to the fullness of Christ? You know, I am reading the Bible and trying to bring her up, but I'm not speaking to her. I'm not speaking one word to her because if I speak, she'll be afraid. That was the kind of terror she had in her life. So, you know, what was our challenge? Our challenge was getting her to sit in the dining table and eat with us. She wants it. She wants to sit on the floor. Getting her to sit on the sofa and watch TV programs along with us. It was a challenge. We struggle like anything. She won't obey. And we had to plead with her. And I had to be stern with her, telling her, you have to sit here. And she, she would become fearful. You know, and there were times when we found her coming and just standing and looking at the dining chair, you know, how she would sit on it. And long story short, she stayed with us for a year. And after the first year, she wanted a break to go and visit her family. So my father-in-law took her back to her family. You know what she did? We never preached one word of gospel to her. So when she went back home, uh, uh, to her home, she told her family, I want to come to Christ and I want to become a Christian. Her family was shocked because they were not Christians. And not only did she stay with them for a month, she took a break for a month. And she called us and said, I'm ready to come back. Will you come back and pick me up? So we went back to pick her up. When we went back to pick her up, we found that she had shared the gospel with her entire family in one month's time. And the entire family was baptized. Praise God. Okay. And that's the beauty of her life. And she stayed with us eight years. And as she was, I told her, I am literally your brother. So I, I have to look into your marriage and try to arrange a marriage. And we were praying for her. And can you believe she married into an affluent business family? She married into an, she's a nobody in her village, her lowest caste, whatever it is. But once they came to Christ, somebody from the Christ was looking for a humble girl. Somebody from the church was looking for a humble girl in her village. And somebody pro pro proposed her name. And they became elated that she's in Bangalore. And when we told her that she came to us as a helper, but she's my sister. When I told her that, and I told her husband, I will give her an inheritance from my family. That is my sister. And the man wept. He said, I was praying for and looking for somebody like this brother. And he embraced me and he, he married her. And to tell you the fact, they were 10 times more affluent than us in by ways of material wealth. That family married, she married into that family. She lives like a queen today. Okay. And she stands to get an inheritance from us. Why am I saying this? You know, this letter of uh, uh, Philemon transformed me. If we can, we live our lives like this. Can you believe she going and evangelizing her entire family of five people? All of them committed to Christ. Today, that is a family that prays for our ministry. They fast 40 days continuously in a year. I mean, their life is exemplary compared to ours. So what am I trying to tell you here? You know, you know, you never know how the Holy Spirit works. Amen. Amen. Okay. Today, Mala sits, she's, she's having her little empire of her own. She has, the, she sits at the dining table. She sits like a, a mistress herself. You know, she has poise. She has composure. It's amazing. It's amazing what Christ can do. Amen. Right. So we close here and let's take some questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. Beautiful testimony. Yeah. So friends, let's have a quick question. Uh, you know, if it is uh, very important, it's already time, seven yeah. o'clock. Uh, so we oh can my. have, yeah, we can have uh, some quick questions, short, yeah. quick questions. Yep. Anybody? Yeah, Cheryl. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, probably you were mentioning something about wrestling with the word till you have a breakthrough. So yeah. um, uh, since you have you know done this, I just wanted to know practically. Sometimes we have many questions popping up in our head, and we we want answers to it. 
do you go at it one at a time or can you ask like a lot of questions and and then god answers whenever or you take one and you create through till you get your answer yeah see you need to know two things one is you are free you are free keep your freedom okay you keep your freedom and the second is god is sovereign so he can answer any time he wants so we have to understand accept and respect the sovereignty of god that he can answer us any time here is an here is a suggestion okay not a prescription a suggestion whenever there are many things you don't understand in the bible in your bible itself make a little note okay my handwriting has improved after i've started making notes in the bible because the space is so small and you got to write so i write i have begun to write really well i have a terrible handwriting all right so you make notes in that little margins little spaces here and there draw your little arrows and what is the right doubt sitting in your mind mention that right doubt word itself okay and in the days to and, and as you write you say lord this is something i am not agreeing with lord i can't do and understand this and i don't agree how you are asking us anyway i am making that note and you just submit it to the lord uh, 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 and deposit it to him as your argument you never know when god will clarify okay because he has the freedom to clarify into your time and you also don't hold on to that and insist and say uh, this is something that i need to go forward nothing is working out you know so don't get into that kind of a, uh, a rigidity with god rigidity is the right word okay so be flexible and say lord but i trust you i know who you are and you are loving that's all i know so i'm going to go forward even though i don't accept or understand this all right i'm going to go forward so what are you telling the lord you're telling the lord i'm going to tarry with you in the relationship i'm not going to make that a condition for our relationship not going to make it a condition for my growth you speak to me whenever you can and i'm looking forward to clarification on this so you just you so you're free to move on and god is free to act in your life whenever he can and he will thank you thank you thank you thank you julius thank you sharel any other questions anybody quick question no i think uh, i think uh, we are done with the questions uh, yeah. so let's pray yeah okay so uh, lord we come to you today thanking you for uh, this wonderful paul lord lord you had him raise so many churches and lord uh, he first over cared for them like a dad like a father lord he was imparting your heart into them and lord he was teaching so many people lord to to be fatherly in their approach to be sacrificial in their giving uh, and diffusing tensions diffusing disputes lord it is amazing how you were raising so much of quality uh, leadership into paul's life and helping him to delegate that into into faithful people that you put around him lord lord today we ask you for this wonderful ministry of, of happy families that you have given joseph and his uh, his uh, spouse and his children are calling to labor into lord even as they have labored into this for one year lord the first 40 days must have been a real worry for them they didn't really they didn't really look forward to how it would go into a year but you and your goodness abba you brought it into a year lord and lord it's such a joyful feeling lord to to just thank you abba for for all your goodness that you showered upon joseph and his family and those six families lord who took up responsibilities in some way lord thank you lord thank you abba that is such a you know lord uh, really lord we can we can look look over this like paul and say wow lord you're doing it you're amazing lord you continue to bless the the other families lord every family in happy family should be blessed father lord raise up every family as a missionary family raise up every family as a witness lord let the impact of uh, happy families ministry lord lord flow through in a in a in a marvelous new year lord we don't know what is your plan for the coming year we don't know what is your plan for sequencing or a uh, plan for continuity or a plan for um, what do you call hybrid or whatever lord lord you 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 gave us the pandemic you gave us online lord i am sure you bring some new structures and uh, new fresh ways to look at this as well lord we look forward to all of that from you thank you lord thank you for your blessing goes forward thank you for the wonder and the richness and the joy of your word thank you lord lord give all of us a good night's rest 
uh, even as we continue to look to answers from you, because in our little margins in the Bible, we're going to start scribbling, we're going to make our notes, and we're going to come to you, Lord, and uh, knowing that you are able to answer us. Thank you, Abba. Thank you. Thank you for the diligent hearts that tune in every day. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory, honor, and praise. And we ask you to bless each one of us as we call it a day now. We make this prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Congratulations, Joseph. Hey, thank Congratulations. you so much, dear. Yes, brother. It was, uh, you know, Congratulations. An anniversary was very special because I have never mm. heard a testimony of anyone who, who was touched by the letter of to mm. Philemon. Philemon's testimony was amazing, uh, Julian. Uh -huh. it, it is so, so beautiful. It's so inspired. Uh, you know, I'm sure it inspired all of us. It's such a beautiful uh, journey you have. Thank you, sure. Brother Julius, for your sister also. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's such a you know, blessing to hear your testimony. God bless Thank you me. all, all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Brother. Thank you, Brother. Thank you, Brother. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. God bless you. Bye-bye. See you all. Thank God.